Howdy once again, this is Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and you are watching part three of a four-part video series on this little three-in-one steam engine by the Miller Company, and it's number 882, the horizontal version of this. So this is still the walking beam, and you watched me put that together in the last episode, so I'm going to convert it to a horizontal, so watch the whole video and there will be a lot of pictures at the end too. Oh, how I would have loved one of these when I was a boy. And we'll see if it can power this uh, huge red lathe here. The American pacemaker. Maybe we can turn some 3 inch diameter steel with it. Give me a thumbs up if you like this type of video because I don't think it's really very popular in terms of steam engines. It's not something that young boys are interested in or even grown men unless you're really old like me and you remember these as a kid. So let's begin. In this video I will be reconfiguring the steam engine into model number two which is a horizontal steam engine. And here's the directions for operating the number two horizontal steam engine by KJ Miller Corporation. Well here's the blueprint for the horizontal version as you can see, and there are still pictures of this at the end if you are interested, and of course this is what it will look like in a few minutes. So I'm going to take this apart, but off camera. You saw me disassemble it in the last video, so no need to show that again. And there are some parts here, obviously, that will not be used, but these parts from my parts bin will be used. Nice little die castings as well. And there's quite a bit of heft to this. There's such quality to this. I know I've been bragging about that or talking about it. it makes you sick probably. But it's just so neat to see these little parts, isn't it? Not stampings, but die castings. And as a little sidebar here, I'm sure you know that Elon Musk making the Teslas is using giga castings. Three big giga castings in the structure of the automobile that has reduced the amount of time that it takes to assemble them and uh, each one of the giga castings takes a uh, place of, of uh, perhaps 75 different little metal stampings so it's really a revolution I'm not sure how many people know about giga castings and the giga die castings machines that are made in Italy let me know in the comments if you do well, at the snap of a finger, you're going to see this stripped down to the basis again and ready for assembly. Well, I changed my mind and I did not totally disassemble it because this wheel and the bearings and everything will be used uh, in the horizontal version. Here are the parts that have not been used yet and will be used over here. And some of these parts here that I just took off will be used, but of course the walking beam and the upright and a few things will not be used. So this is what we're concerned with right now. And I think I'll start by putting the cam and the little crank back on, which I just now took off. And that was necessary in order to put this little... Uh, offset piece that of course is the uh, eccentric for moving the valve and the linkage or rather obtuse linkage so that'll go on like that and some things I'm not going to show because they're too tedious as you can understand I love this little eccentric die casting and look at that uh, split there. That, that tooling would be very expensive. There probably was a die just for this part. With, of course, the brass insert. Now, in order to convert this from uh, this configuration into a horizontal, I use this little saddle casting. At least that's what I'm calling it. By the way, there never was a parts list giving the names unless it was lost. But I'm not aware of a separate parts list ever. And the cylinder will be fastened on to the casting with these two little Phillips heads. And I'm surprised to use Phillips head back then because the erector sets did not. And it would have been so much better with the Phillips. 
Now there's a lot of holes here which for a young boy might be daunting but all he had to do was look at the drawing and you can see that for instance these two holes will be used to hold the cylinder uh, casting on and some of the holes are not shown so I think that is a good explanation for a boy. Again, very incredible engineering here, so we have just one screw holding this on and a peg. So there's no need for two fasteners. Simply goes in like that, and then the nut on the bottom. Stroke of genius, Mr. Miller. This product came out after the war, so it was probably engineered either in the 30s or during the war, and I'll tighten that and then I'm ready to put the cylinder on. Are you aware that most 14 year old boys that came into my metal working class had no idea how to measure or what direction to turn a screw? Righty tighty, lefty loosey, they did not know that. This little casting mounts way back by the boiler. You see these two holes back here? And I'll tighten those off camera. Let me go ahead and install the piston into the cylinder and you can see there there's a little wrist pin, ever so little. And I'm not sure why that little washer is in there, a little spacer washer, but that's the way it came to me so it must be correct. So again, a little bit of oil on everything as you assemble it. Get in there. And now, there's kind of an important little part. It's just a little bushing or spacer, brass of course. And this is a shoulder bolt. Goes right through there and screws into the crank. Pretty awesome so far. Ah uh, yeah. Let's put this little die casting onto the eccentric strap right now. You know what I was just thinking as I was looking at the blueprint? How awesome would it be if they actually were manufacturing something like this today to make a video of how to do it? Matter of fact, the exact video you're watching right now would be perfect to be included with a kit like this. And then the little brass hex bolt right into here with a nut on the other side. This little part is a portion of the valve linkage, so it simply goes in with a brass hex screw and there's a nut on the bottom which is kind of fussy, so I'll do that off camera. And next, let's get the eccentric strap connected to this uh, L-shaped piece, whatever it may be cost called. <laughs> get your hands out of the way, Mr. Pete. So in that hole goes another little brass screw, hex head, and a nut on the bottom. Again, fiddly, I'll do that off camera. Okay, the valve goes in here like this. That's the spool valve. But before I put it in, I think I'll attach it to the dog bone where it's easier to get at because I gotta tell you, some of these parts that I call fiddly, like getting the nut on underneath here, was real tricky and took me a long time and it might have been frustrating to a little boy, I don't know. Maybe they are more dexterous than I am? Or is it dexterous? Even that little nut. Look at my big fat 80 year old finger struggling with that. Snug it up, but too much pressure could break the casting. Now if a fella expects this to run like a sewing machine, for best results use Singer sewing machine oil. in like that and one final screw and believe it or not I had all the fasteners and then a tiny brass nut on the bottom and we're just about done this has been fun did you enjoy it? and now to connect the steam line under the nipple here that'll hold it nicely 
and now I'm going to oil each and every moving part. I won't show all of that, but certainly I want some on the eccentric here, so I'll do that off camera, and we'll be back to fire it up. And I notice that it turns much easier in one direction than the other. There's just an awful lot of moving parts here, and that's friction to slow it down compared to the, uh, the beam engine. Look at all the moving parts and linkages. I've used all of the parts that I talked about earlier, but look at all the parts now that are available for the other configurations. Well, what I'm going to do now, and this is the exciting part, there's already water in the boiler from the previous video, so let's plug it in and I'll be back in three and a half minutes. All right, I'm back. Notice that this engine runs counterclockwise. The beam engine ran in the clockwise direction. Boy, that takes quite, it takes off right away, doesn't it? They're so silent. That's one of the beauties. You know what? I need to put this in the pan so I don't get water all over the bench. Now, what boy wouldn't love this? Well, any boy that has an iPhone, I guess. So, uh, show this to your grandkids or see if you can get a boy interested in this. I know my grandsons aren't interested in it, so yours probably will not be either. Raise your hand if you knew I was going to do this. But believe it or not, this little engine barely has the power to turn this over under no load. Well, this is the load. So what am I going to do about that? And this is just an experiment, although I've done it off camera a few days ago. There's a tremendous heat loss here, isn't there? So I'm going to take an amazing material that is now illegal and is super dangerous and it's wiped in color and I'm going to encase the Bakelite boiler in there and see if it will produce a little more pressure. So I made this insulative sleeve last week out of a highly illegal material. Let's see if it makes any difference at all. That's what they use on real steam engines, you know. Now I've got to plug it back in. One other point I wanted to tell you here is that this is not grounded, so I know there's going to be some safety Nazis that tell me to rewire it, and I probably will do that at some point. Well, there it is. It does run quite a bit better now with the insulation on, but I also noticed that you can't see it in the frame here, but it is sizzling up here at the pop-off valve, so the pressure is evidently a little excessive. But it does turn the, the little lathe, not that well. I have several other little accessories, something like this, but they're not in good condition. They're missing parts and need to be restored. And I was low on water. When I was off camera there, I did have to add another enema tube of water. Well, that concludes part three of this video series. Uh, be sure and tune in when available for part four, where I turn this into a vertical engine. Lots of pictures at the end. Thank you for joining me. Give me a thumbs up if I deserve it. And tell your friends about this video. See you next time. Let's talk a little bit about erector sets. I did have an erector set, my brother and I did, at about this time. This is 1950. And uh, I loved it. It was a used one, had some missing parts, but it didn't matter. And this was the kind of thing that my dad would get us. And he got it from other faculty members. We had nothing new. So the same man who had quite a bit of money, he was, his name was Dean Wilmot, and he was like the disciplinarian of the high school. And his boys were older than uh, my brother and I, so we got the hand-me-downs. And another thing that uh, he had was the Gilbert chemical set, uh, chemistry set. So... 
these are so awesome if only and what they have nowadays is, that's still pretty good is the Lego sets. I had to laugh that every one of the Gilbert companies <laughs> advertisements said hello boys <laughs> so and this is all out of proportion here I'm sure because it is an ad and all ads are lies you know what my dad was a bad man he wouldn't buy us toys but he would bring home for us to play with a Sperry gyroscope an army tank periscope altimeters and all kinds of gadgets like that which he would turn us loose with and uh, to play with and take apart and all of that so that's where my basis for mechanics was born here's a little sideboard for you extra credit if you will and it's strictly about the bases on these various little uh, toys that I have right here and this is well I still have a few more engines but I've gotten rid of, of a lot of them because I'm losing interest and my errors could care less so but anyway what I wanted to show you in this particular one is the various type of bases on which these different engines are built because I've been bragging up this beautiful little die cast base on the Miller engine which I absolutely adore and on this little Sterling engine it is also a die cast type of base I don't know why I like these but I really do and it gives some heft and weight to the toy as well well on this old Whedon engine the entire base on it is cast iron but this is 100 years old so it is very heavy and I told you that my dad didn't buy us many toys I told you that already but we did have or my brother had this exact model not this exact engine but this model of Empire which I really think is well built and I love it and it does work and it has a cast iron base as well so it is quite heavy made in two rivers Wisconsin but as time went on they made them cheaper and cheaper so that people could afford them but this little one from England this is a mammoth and it's pretty cool too but a lot of theirs had uh, stamped steel bases which could be well the uh, the tooling would have been expensive but BAM they could stamp it that quickly and all the holes in there and it still made a pretty decent base I've got several Jensen engines and they have plywood bases I think they made them with metal bases too but uh, and I really do not like this although it's perfectly functional because it's just three-quarter inch plywood as you can see and if it got wet possibly it was it could be damaged I don't know but this one is not delaminated so they did probably varnish it but some of the engines that I made like this little creators here are of course are cast bases cast aluminum that is so well that's enough on this little diatribe here if you will uh, <laughs> the bases of toy steam engines hope you enjoyed it you know what I bet mister Miller died a pauper he could not possibly have made any money with this and he's in a pauper's grave just like I will be someday. No money in this, but there's lots of fun.